State. Adrian is famous not only for his work in operator algebras, quantum groups, and many other branches of mathematics of which I'm not even aware, I imagine. But he's also famous for his singing, his operatic recitals, for his mathematical sculptures, and so forth and so on. So he would tell us about all of these, perhaps. Well, I'm not sure about the singing, but... Uh, <laughs> that, that is tonight. No, it's tonight, tonight at, right. uh, eight, at 7.30, I think, at uh, uh, Eisenbart's uh, place. In any case, his talk, which was visible a few seconds ago, is now erased. Um, <laughs> I had a piece of paper here, but it's gone. Uh, here we go. Quantum subgroups and higher coxeter graphs. Adrian. Thank you very much. So I would, uh, I would like to uh, uh, talk uh, in the first three minutes uh, to uh, speak about the two members of the uh, of the Mackay two of the members of the Mackay correspondence, which are encoded in this uh, sculpture. So this was made at Penn State. It's a new way of rendering uh, four-dimensional objects. It's a uh, windowed uh, radial stereographic projection. And uh, here there's a piece of the Penn State, uh, well, actually, it's not missing from the Penn State <laughs> sculpture, but it's an extra piece that, uh, that we had. So this, uh, uh, this is one of the little triangles uh, which you see there. And um, it's a 24 cell, which I call the uh, the octa cube. It's a fourth among the four dimensional regular solids. And the rendering method is new. I'll talk about this tomorrow, uh, but uh, here's how it looks in its uh, site. Um, uh, here there's uh, the sculpture, uh, and then close ups. You should uh, let me uh, magnify it a little bit. Uh, notice uh, one uh, uh, interesting thing. It's, it's very hard. It, the image is a bit washed out, but uh, let me go to the next, uh, the next slides, and then I'll show you some uh, details. So this, was a, this is a view from the corner in which you see a symmetry related to the Lie group G2. And... Uh, and here, if you notice uh, uh, on this, that, uh, that you can see it here, that the reflections in, uh, in the stainless steel of the parts in front of it matches, match what's in the back. So although it's made of stainless steel, when it's put together, it looks like it's made of glass. Uh, they worked about 1,500 hours to... to put it together. You can see the same here. Look, this is, this looks like it's transparent. Now, uh, what are the members, the, the two members of, uh, of the Mackay correspondence that I'll be talking about? Uh, on the one side, you have subgroups of SU2. SU2 uh, is almost the same as uh, the rotation group SO3. It has subgroups related to the platonic solids. And uh, the sculpture represents, if you use the vertices, the uh, binary tetrahedral group, so the symmetries of the tetrahedral in 3D. Uh, it's not just the vertices, but every point, the, uh, the edges represent uh, special rotations of the tetrahedron, which map one vertex into another vertex. Uh, the faces as well, and even the holes in it, the holes can be described uh, as a play of lights in the regular solids as drawn by Leonardo da Vinci, in, uh, something that is being taught uh, these days in the schools of visual arts and architecture. So I have made an interactive Java machine, which I'll show tomorrow, in which you walk uh, with one point on the sculpture and the, and the tetrahedron shows its structure. So this way you get the E6 and E7 affine. Now on the Lie algebra side, it's even richer. These are the roots of type D4, and, uh, and uh, each segment represents an angle of 60 degrees. 
So each circle is one of the hexagons in the root lattice. Now, if you start to use, uh, if you start to use also the, the middle of the faces, parts of them you'll get B4 and C4. And uh, finally, if you use all the middle of the faces of these uh, three-dimensional rooms as well, then you'll get the root system of type F4. And um, it's also, this is very good, the graph D, D4, which is a letter Y, has very many symmetries. So multiple laced uh, Lie algebras arise out of these symmetries. So in particular, projecting on a plane first, then on an, uh, on an edge, one gets a root systems of type uh, B3, C3, and respectively G2. So one can see exactly how these, uh, how these structures arise. It's also the, uh, the vertices are also coming, uh, are also encoding the 24 spheres which surround the sphere in uh, the lattice, in the closed lattice packing, which is tight, uh, precisely in dimensions two, four, eight, and uh, finally the leech lattice 24. So this is one of the tight ones, and you can see the spheres. In fact, uh, in the pictures that you had before, uh, in the pictures that you had at the beginning, I, I might be able to um, uh, show you here that uh, if you look at the base of the sculpture, here there are some circles which are exactly the intersection of those uh, close packing spheres with uh, at the base. So the, the sculpture is human size, about six feet, and is brought by the base to, uh, to eye level. So more about this tomorrow. Now about the Mackay correspondence. In a short paper in 1990, Mackay made uh, the following crucial observation that the Carton matrix of a unimodular fine Lie algebra has um, uh, the form two times the identity minus uh, matrix, and that matrix is a adjacency matrix of a graph, delta G, delta gamma. So uh, if you want uh, the, uh, the inner product to be uh, 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 positive, uh, positively defined or semi-definite, uh, um, semi then uh, you need uh, that the matrix of the graph should, be, should have norm less than two. Uh, this restricts precisely the graphs to uh, the graphs uh, of uh, type ADE together with another graph which he didn't address but we will address actually in this, uh, in this talk. There are some tadpoles which have also norm less than or uh, equal to two and which do not appear for some deeper reasons in the structure of uh, SU2. And now... Um, um, The reason I think why this was, uh, this was discovered quite late, only in 1990, is that uh, this correspondence is between, uh, I mean, there are two correspondences, and each one has one side which is relatively classical and one which is new, relatively new. So if you work with the uh, Kleinian subgroup, so this part is 100 years old, right, the subgroups of, uh, of SU2, then the graph that you'll get will have norm equal to two. And then the Carton matrix will have uh, one degenerate direction. And so the correspondence is done with an affine simple Lie algebra, which is a relatively new object. On the other hand, if you want to work with a Lie, uh, simple Lie groups, which have uh, non-degenerate Carton matrix, this part is, uh, is um, uh, again, relatively classical. The other side will have some strange objects uh, that uh, were mentioned in the talk before, which uh, I've introduced about 1993, uh, uh, starting in 1993, these quantum subgroups of SU2. And uh, uh, so these, uh, this is a new part. So each one involves an old and a new part. And maybe that's why... Uh, that's why the correspondence has been made quite late. Now, the, um, uh, in the second member, uh, what uh, we're going to show is that the, if you take the AD, the non-affine graphs, 
They have natural irreducible objects as vertices and have edges given by tensoring. So they're like a Cayley graph for tensoring with, uh, with some objects. But those objects are, are not, uh, uh, are not uh, so well known, not as well known as the others. Moreover, there's a crucial difference between uh, these and the, um, and, uh, the uh, usual structures that one associates to the ADEs, namely that uh, Dodd and D7 are very different from the other ADEs. Namely, there's no self-contained multiplication, tensoring, on the vertices of a Dodd or of an E7. You cannot put objects on the vertices so that uh, one of them is the identity, the trivial object, its neighbor is the, the generator, and so that the graph corresponds to the tensoring with the generator. So um, they are only modules. They can be tensored with something from outside. Uh, they're like cosets in, uh, uh, with respect to a subgroup. So they can be multiplied by the subgroup, but, uh, but not multiplied among themselves. Uh, with a result still of the same form. Now, the method for doing this is uh, extremely simple, and I'm always surprised that uh, it wasn't looked at before. If you have a monoidal tensor category, and I'll describe it, let me describe it first uh, briefly, you have a set of irreducible objects. You have some Euclidean vector spaces, home from X tensor Y to Z, so they model, in a way, the, uh, the tensoring structure of representations of a uh, finite group or compact group or so without, uh, without the commutativity, with the trivial object one. And uh, the rest of the data are some uh, 6J symbols, some coefficients for changing bases corresponding to associativity. If you tensor X tensor Y tensor Z and you take the home up to T, you can decompose it first uh, in one way, x tensor y first, or then y tensor z, on the other hand. Now, um, the main axiom is a pentagonal identity which expresses the naturality of base change. So, uh, just the fact that if you put a change, uh, if you use a coefficient for associativity several times in a row, you get uh, the natural thing. And um, this way one gets symmetry relations. Each object has a conjugate relation. Moreover, the home space have the symmetry of the group S3 acting on the triangle with uh, edges X, Y, Z. That's called Frobenius reciprocity. And finally, the, the coefficients, uh, the 6J symbols themselves have the symmetry of the tetrahedron. Uh, sometimes one adds to this uh, some additional data, which is a braiding. Uh, distinguished home from X tensor Y to Y tensor X for each uh, X and Y, which commutes with the fusion. So remaining at this uh, category uh, point of view, the idea is extremely simple. Uh, see, what you have to do is, is uh, make the same transition that you do from uh, going from uh, loops at a point to paths between points on a manifold, from a group to a groupoid. So maybe it should be called, after all, something like a categoroid or so, but... Uh, so we have a set of labels, which we call types, A, B, C. Um, each object has, uh, has, a, a, uh, has two types, one on the left and one on the right. Uh, this, uh, the motivation for me was the fact that I was looking at uh, inclusions A into B of operator algebras, and what comes out naturally there are bimodules. So with A, A included in B, you have B as an AB bimodule, and you start with that, you tensor and decompose. So the objects are of type AB. And... Uh, Not really. I mean, it's still, uh, it's still the same, the same uh, kind, uh, you know, it's still the same kind of object, except that the objects have types. Now, what uh, uh, the homes are defined only for, uh, for uh, uh, matching things, like XAB tends to YBC with uh, the result of type AC. Yes? 
And uh, if, in particular, if you take all the objects of the same kind, AA, then you have a, the usual monoidal tensor category. So monoidal tensor category is just uh, something that you get at every node. It's exactly what you do on a manifold. With, uh, uh, but there are some, uh, so the only conditions that we need to impose are the non-degeneracy, namely you don't want to have extra things. So in particular, X tensor X bar, you see if X is of type AB, should decompose into A, into your given A objects. Yes, so otherwise you could put all kinds of uh, other irrelevant things. And here's uh, uh, one which we can, uh, one condition which we can afford to put in this case. It's a non-redundancy condition that for any distinct label base BC, uh, distinct labels, there should be no invertible, uh, no invertible by module of type BC. Now, if you have its dimension, it shouldn't have dimension one. If uh, Invertible means that x tends to x bar gives you the identity. And this, uh, if you had such a thing, then the, uh, then the objects of type BB would be simply the objects of type AA conjugated by this element. And this is indeed the case of uh, manifolds. That's why there are uh, lots of books on loops at a point, but uh, not many, not so much on paths. So you get uh, loops at any other point by simply moving from one point to the other one. So here we can afford to avoid this and look only at the distinct ones. In particular, if you take the minimum uh, of the log of the dimension of uh, an object, this is a distance between, between the labels A, B. And uh, what we are looking for is a maximal extension. So you start with objects of type AA, and you want to find all the possible B, C, Ds, and so on with all the possible objects with this condition. And that's called the maximal atlas. And um, the uh, nice uh, theorem here, the rigidity theorem, you proved using compactness. I presented at a conference in Rome uh, around 1996 or so, was it? Uh, is that uh, if you have a finite number of objects of type AA, then uh, this maximal atlas is finite. So there are finitely many possibilities, B, C, and so on. So um, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, so the problem is, uh, looks all either, either trivial or impossible, but actually it, it lies just in the right uh, place in between. So um, once you have such a, once you have two of these labels, and uh, one such example, uh, which we'll discuss a little bit later, is a case of a finite group. In that case, you have objects of type AA, which are group elements, and objects of type BB, which are group representations. So once you have this, you can compute the manifold invariants, three manifold invariants, in the style of Turai v Rho, and <coughs> Excuse me, with this uh, move, with a barycentric move that you see here, you can remove first a vertex labeled A and replace it by a vertex labeled B. So one by one, you can change the labels of all the vertices in your manifold. And this way, your manifold gives you a theorem in uh, representation theory, namely, that its invariant computed with group elements is the same as its invariant computed with group representations. So uh, you can be almost sure that each time you see a theorem in a representation theory book that states that something for group elements is the same uh, computed with group representations, the theorem itself is given by a manifold and uh, a three-dimensional manifold. Uh, you can, uh, this, you can almost, uh, I mean, you can prove it, uh, uh, I, but I, I won't, uh, I, there's a meta proof which, which shows that, uh, um, that you can go uh, from one to the other. In any case, the lens space, the projective space, uh, uh, the real projective uh, three-dimensional space, the lens space of type 2, 1, will give you the frobenius Schuh theorems. So let me uh, point out here the, the theorems that, that uh, appear. So the sphere gives you the fact that the number of elements in the group is the same as the sum of the squares of representations. 
and the projective plane or length space gives you the fact that the number of elements of square equals equal to one in a group is the same as the number of representations uh, for which the tensor square contains a trivial element. Yes, each one is counted with a dimension, not the dimension square, but the dimension, and with a sign which is called uh, the Frobenius Schur index, and which shows how, the, uh, how a certain intertwiner behaves when you switch these two members. The intertwiner from one to here, how does it behave when you switch the, the, the two members? So this is. Uh, this is an example in which, uh, which shows that it's extremely natural, actually. I mean, these are not just drawings, the things that I'm going to show you, but the fact that homes, uh, that the homomorphisms uh, uh, of uh, usual binary objects live naturally in, in the plane. So they're, they're naturally labeled, labeled by and behaving like uh, two-dimensional pieces, uh, pieces of surfaces. And their coefficients, uh, feel empty three-dimensional space. Moreover, because of the tensoriality property that I was mentioning before, the decomposition into pieces, uh, they are uh, precisely the data that one needs to build quantum field theory in two dimensions. So uh, if you're asking yourself why they are, they are, uh, the, the uh, uh, quantum field theories which are built are always two-dimensional, remember that uh, String theory uses, uh, does most of the mathematics on a two-dimensional sheet as well. That's because uh, the data that we have, the usual binary objects, give us coefficients precisely for these. So uh, uh, in this talk, I'll try to discuss also some uh, possible directions for breaking this dimension, uh, this dimension um, barrier. Now, uh, let me uh, mention here, uh, go a bit toward quantum subgroups. Uh, the Q deformations have appeared from Euler's time, who noticed that you can replace numbers by Q numbers, so it's a very, very uh, classical concept. Uh, you deform the number, the natural number n, uh, to the quantum number uh, given by this expression, which should be familiar to everybody here. So. Uh, for instance, uh, the quantum number three is Q inverse plus one plus Q. Q is a parameter. Now, formally, see in this expression, you can replace N by a vector. So you can get uh, formally for every vector space, uh, space uh, Q to the power V, of course, uh, which behaves, uh, which transforms additivity into multiplicativity. Now, the question is, why would you do such a thing? Because it's just an isomorphism. But once you use an exponentiation to define uh, multiplication, you still have the additivity as well. So you can now add and multiply, which is a big step ahead. So, um, and if you want to quantize, one wants to quantize SU2, and here historically things had to wait from Euler, well, through the discovery of the, of the simple uh, and classification of the simple Lie groups up to around 1990, when uh, from statistical mechanics on one hand and from uh, um, algebraic geometry, so uh, Drimbo, uh, Drinfeld and Jimbo, uh, found that uh, the uh, simple Lie groups have also a, a Q analog. And that Q analog is basically obtained by replacing the vector space H, the diagonal of the Lie group, by Q to the H. And uh, the, uh, the commutant EF is equal to H is replaced by EF is equal to the quantum H, which uh, was described before. So with this, the dimension of an irreducible representation of SU2 of degree n is a quantum number n plus 1. So in particular, if you are at a root of unity, uh, at, the nth, at the tenth root of unity, say, then the dimension 10 is equal to 0. Um, and uh, uh, so you're going to have the representations only up to dimension 9. So this is uh, uh, what's very nice is that you, you, uh, you remain with only finitely many representations, and they form the, a uh, tensor category which is braided, exactly what we were discussing about before. Now, um, mm, 
We take now, and this, was, uh, this is a step which, uh, which brings us directly to quantum groups, we take as AA objects, remember we, had, we are going from AA objects to objects of all, kinds, uh, of all other kinds. So we take as AA objects precisely the, uh, the representations of SU2 at, uh, at the nth root of unity. So you have uh, n minus 2 representations. Those are your AA objects. You have uh, homes, uh, you have everything for them. And you're asking, what can they tensor? What can they act upon? Yes. And uh, uh, it will turn out that uh, the labels B, C, and so on that you get are precisely those ADE graphs which have the same coxeta number, so the same norm of the graph as your uh, given graph. So the norm of the graph should be uh, uh, the quantum number 2, which is uh, 2 cosine of pi over n. So if you are at the, at the uh, uh, 30th root of unity, you will have uh, 3. So this maximal atlas will have 3 uh, vertices, A, D, and E. So you'll have objects of type AA, AD, AE, D, and so on. Uh, while if you are at an odd... Uh, odd root of unity, uh, then you will have only the initial point. So that's a maximal atlas. Now, in the finite group case, the reducible objects, which can be computed quite easily, uh, are, uh, I mean, the, the labels of the maximal uh, atlas are, uh, are precisely... Um, pairs between subgroups up to inner conjugacy and two cocycles with scalar with um, values uh, uh, invertible complex numbers so um, you have a subgroup and a two cocycle on it another subgroup and another two cocycle and the irreducible objects of type hk are precisely representatives of double cosets, HDK, together with the reducibles of the stabilizer group, H intersected with GKG inverse, perturbed by the two cocycles, one on the right, one on the left. And in particular, the objects of type 1-1 uh, are exactly group elements the objects of type GG are group representations. And if you have a subgroup, then the objects, a subgroup K, then the objects of type KG are uh, uh, the, uh, the, the graph G itself, I, I mean, are the, uh, the um, irreducibles of the subgroup. So what we have here are irreducibles of the subgroup. And that's exactly the Mackay picture. The vertices of the graphs ADE in the affine case are exactly irreducibles of the subgroups of, uh, of SU2. So now here's how, uh, here is how, uh, uh, how, uh, The same picture looks like uh, in, uh, just a bit, so I think that this is a little bit jumpy. Just a bit. So I will. Sometimes it's it's moving in a strange way. So I will go just back. One second. Yes. Now what you can see there at the at the bottom is a uh, is a graph is a quantum subgroup in a way a couple of sub quantum subgroups a d and d so the objects of type aa are exactly the reducibles of su2 
cut off at the root of unity. You see that instead of the usual half line, you have only a finite number of them. Uh, the um, other vertices, so here we are at the twelfth root of unity, are the uh, uh, D and E. There's a graph D7 and D6 which have the same Coxeter number. Now here you see that the objects of type AD are labeled by the graph D and the objects of type AE are labeled by the graph E and the objects of type AA by the graph A. So these are exactly the Mackay, uh, uh, this is the analog of the Mackay picture. So the objects, we, ha we have found irreducible objects. Yes, so a priori they're only a module because uh, a graph G, the objects of a graph uh, G appear as type, as having type AG. Yes, so they can be multiplied only by objects of type AA. However, so they are in a bit, if you, if you like, a geometrical analogy, they're a bit like uh, symmetric spaces. You have a group, a symmetric group which acts on a manifold, and the manifold is just uh, is a kind of quotient. Now, in this case, however, what you can do is look at the automorphisms of the manifold, and if you find there the graph itself, then it means that you have the manifold acting upon itself. And then it's a group. So in particular, in the case of E6, you look at its self-symmetries and you find that you find here the graph E6. Look, the shape of the letter E. Uh, so this means that E6 acts on E6, and this is the E6 is a subgroup. While if you look at the at the graph, at uh, the self-symmetries of, of type D, then you see that the graph that appears is AN. And um, yes, I'll discuss this a little bit more later. Now, the internal structure, so these, these quantum subgroups appear uh, as uh, objects, irreducible objects, homes between objects, uh, uh, 6J symbols, and so on, but uh, not what doesn't appear is the internal structure, which, is, which remains an, uh, an open problem. However, the Kleinian invariant theory has a very interesting quantum analog. So since a lot of people here are interested in the quantum, uh, quantum uh, uh, in the uh, invariant theory, which led to singularities and uh, uh, so on. Let me, uh, let me uh, discuss that a little bit. Here's a comparison between the invariants in the classical and quantum subgroups of SU2, and I chose the biggest one, the binary icosahedral group. Now in the classical, you see a line here. This is a model of quantum field theory with uh, edges, which you may have uh, seen. Uh, the line here labeled K is a spin k over 2, or the uh, uh, degree k, irreducible of SU2. So um, in particular, uh, you have uh, an invariant of degree 12. What this means is you have the, the, the irreducible of degree 12 of SU2, which goes in, and nothing comes out. You see, the irreducible of degree 12 contains a trivial representation. Here's a degree 12, here there's nothing that's a trivial representation for the subgroup, yes? So if you had the whole uh, Lie group, then uh, the irreducible of degree 12 wouldn't contain anything in particular, but in this case it does. That's a, the invariant of degree 12 of uh, Klein. Uh, the invariant of degree 20 can be built out of the one of degree 12, taking these 12 wires, moving two to a neighbor, to another copy, and these two wires, which are curved like this, can be read exactly as a Hessian. Those are the two partial derivatives, which lower the degree by two. And this way you get the invariant y as a Hessian of x. And finally, you can take, uh, you can join one here. So you can take 11 and 19 out and symmetrize them, the rectangle is a symmetrization, and that way you'll get the invariant of degree 30, z, that, that if you remember these are the polynomials which have roots uh, 
at the vertices of the dodecahedron, icosahedron in the, in the mid edges by stereographic projection. If you have read Klein's book. So you get this way the invariant of degree 30 as a Jacobian of the two. Now you may ask yourself, why didn't we put other things here, three and four and so on? Well, Klein already knew and, uh, that uh, if you take other combinations, they'll all be zero. So these were the only non-zero combinations. Now what happens for the actual E8 subgroup of quantum SU2? The invariant of degree 12 is, has instead degree 10 here. The invariant uh, Y has degree 18 and is obtained instead of Hessian by Jacobian. So the derivatives take also one step down. And here, instead of the Jacobian, for Z use the actual product of the two. Moreover, in the classical case, you have all kinds of polynomials in XYZ, modular the famous relation of Klein. Uh, however, in the uh, quantum case, there are no invariants other than one X, Y, and Z. So any product is either one, one of these or otherwise it's zero. And these degrees are precisely the exponents of the Lie group E8. Uh, moreover, graphically, if you work with this graphically, you see that in the case, uh, in the case, in the classical case, things braid in a degenerate way, while in the quantum case, uh, the invariant X looks like it has a prong standing out of the uh, out of the screen. So you can move a, uh, move a string underneath, but not over it. So it's chiral. So this gives, gives rise to two uh, uh, E8s, two quantum subgroups of type E8s, which are complex conjugate to each other. The coefficients are complex conjugate to each other. And uh, yes, so uh, uh, here are all the, um, the self-symmetries of the graphs ADE. So the objects of type EE e and so on. Uh, there are 12, um, there are here uh, 12 of type E6, 18 of type E7, uh, 17 of type E7, and 32 of type E8. Uh, there are almost as many as uh, the uh, Coxeter number, which is one of the, uh, one of the uh, mysteries of the, of the theory still. If you take quantum symmetries of graphs of the classical ADE graphs, there you have a finite number of parameters for them. And if you look at uh, graphs which are, have norm bigger than two, then the classification of these uh, is wild. Now, here is how the symmetries look like. What happens is, so this is again a Cayley graph, just like the one in the, in the Mackay correspondence. But what you have here, is, um, is the fact that you have a uh, standard generator right and left. These are corresponding to the, uh, to the two structures which braid with each other on SU2, on quantum SU2. So there are two, two generators, a red and a blue one, and you have here the Cayley graph for the red one and the Cayley graph for the blue one. And uh, the total structure theorem is that uh, the, uh, uh, the objects of type EE are the product of uh, the left of the red graph of the subgroup generated by the red element with a subgroup generated by the blue element over the intersection, which is called the ambichiral. So you have two generators. Uh, it's, uh, it's similar to what you'd have in a, in a subgroup uh, situation where you'd have two copies, the left and the right, two subgroups, and the whole group would be the product of the two over their intersection. The product is done here over the intersection using a Hopf algebra product. So now the chiral world's picture is that you have uh, the upper world, which is exactly what we were describing before, with a, uh, with a uh, uh, invariance with a prong pointing down. Another sheet, so a tensor product for quantum field theory, another sheet with a, uh, with a prong uh, going up. In between, uh, there's something that kills everything except for uh, 
except for, uh, those ambi for the ambichiral objects that I was describing before. And in general, the invariants have a left degree and a right degree. So it's just like, uh, so there's no more one degree like in the Klein theory, but a dual degree. And it turns out that the famous modular invariant uh, matrix that uh, 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 Yasuyuki Kawahigashi was talking about it counts exactly the number of uh, modular invariants in each dimension. So if you want the number of invariants of degree uh, uh, five, uh, 5, it's exactly 1 in this situation. This is E6. So sometimes the upper and the lower world are connected straight. There's no, no uh, twist at the connection. And what that gives are the subgroups, and they're called type 1 in physics. Uh, in some other cases, the diagrams, look, this is a strange diagram, D10, which sits in a very uncomfortable position here. And it's paired with another copy of D10 in a strange way. The neck, in particular, is paired with a leg. The neck here, which is this one, is paired with one of the legs of the D10. This is a strange thing that happens only for D10. And it turns out that this produces a graph of type E7. So uh, that's, this is quite strange always at first sight that the graph E7 comes as a product of two copies of D10. So um, uh, let me show here a very elementary way to think of, uh, of the, all those objects that, you, that were discussed before. Think might seem very abstract, but what you, what you really take is you take one graph, G, and another graph. Let's take it right now also, a graph G. And you, you try to map one onto the other. Now, if you'd map them vertex to vertex and so on, you would have a symmetry of the graph. And that's exactly what gives rays to multiple laced edges and so on. But there are very few symmetries for the graphs AD. What you look at here is a, in the spirit of quantum mechanics, a quantum symmetry. That is, you want to map uh, edges into linear combinations of edges. And the way to do it is for each edge on the upper part and on the lower part, you give a, uh, you, you give a cell, you give a number in a, in a rectangle, exactly like the one used by quant in uh, statistical mechanics. So the data for mapping one graph to another are these vertical graphs together with complex numbers in every square. And these must satisfy some natural conditions that they are scaled unitaries. If you go from, uh, if you keep two corners fixed, then from one half of the square to the other half of the square, it's, uh, it's up to a scalar unitary. Once you have this, this is a, uh, this would give, and once this is irreducible, so if you cannot write it as a union of two things, uh, this is precisely one of the vertices of the graphs that you have seen. So those arise naturally just as symmetries of the graphs. You don't need to know anything at all, not even the quantum SU2 and so on. So you can compose two of these by putting them one under the other and then removing the, the things in between, exactly the same way in which you compose braids or so. And then you decompose into irreducibles, and that's a fusion. So this gives you, and uh, so this gives in particular the most elementary way to discuss uh, uh, the uh, quantum cutoff of SU2. It's simply as self-symmetries of this kind of the graph AN. Absolutely elementary. And uh, uh, let me uh, skip here to the, uh, so uh, there was, uh, I should mention that uh, uh, I have uh, put these initially into a, into a form using uh, uh, topological quantum field theory. So labels for edges and uh, Hilbert spaces for triangles. And so they have been, uh, re uh, they have been written in an equivalent way um, using sectors uh, in, uh, uh, by, uh, uh, as you have heard in the previous talk, and you, oh, as a category by Kirillov and Ostrich. But the point is that it's very easy to move between the two. I mean, there's a dictionary. So the, the main problem is the construction and the classification of examples uh, really with whatever method you, uh, you want to have. 
So in the, uh, when we first described this, we, I, I have indicated a method to use a braided, a braided cat tensor category to, to uh, progress toward classification. And indeed, it, uh, I will present now the classification for the SU3 case. Uh, there was a bottle of champagne of uh, the French physicists, Di Francesco and Zuber, who had a, a group of examples. Uh, the examples were actually contained all the classification eventually, but they had an extra one. So they had some, some uh, bad ones which, uh, which had to be removed. So um, the definition itself was missing, but... Uh, but uh, Zuber accepted the, uh, the change of definition into the, the uh, classification of quantum subgroups. So here are the results for SU3. Uh, so these are the higher Coxeter graphs. They are the higher analogs. Uh, so the usual uh, Coxeter graphs arrived as uh, graphs of subgroups and modules of SU2. These are the same for SU3. You have four series. See, this is SU3 cutoff. You recognize this very easily. These are the irreducibles of SU3 cutoff. Uh, this is an orbifold which comes from the left-right flip. You can see that this is a middle axis. Uh, these are orbifolds which come from rotation by three. And this one comes from both rotation and the flip. So they are orbifolds which come in a very clear way arise in a very clear way, although for very high uh, SUNs, uh, these orbifolds still have uh, things to be, uh, to be computed. And then there are the exceptional ones, the exceptional subgroups. See, here is an exceptional subgroup which has 12, uh, 12 uh, irreducibles. And here's another one with 12. And here's uh, one at uh, level 21. So uh, this is the highest level for, uh, for SU3. So this is exactly a, a, a something like the Mackay graph, but uh, for quantum subgroups. Uh, they're much better behaved, notice here, than the, uh, than the subgroups of the actual SU3. There are lots of subgroups in exceptional positions there. Here there are only three quantum subgroups and three uh, modules and four modules of them. So the modules come from uh, a symmetry of the ambichiral, uh, of the ambichiral uh, graphs, uh, parts of them. Now, what, uh, what I have found was that for those graphs to exist, you see there are very many graphs with norm, uh, 10 minutes? 15, yes. Okay, so for, for, there are lots of graphs of norm less than three. So what you have here is uh, there are some numbers in each cell, complex numbers, which satisfy some local conditions of cohomological type. And, uh, and the statement is that if you have those numbers, then the graphs come from a quantum subgroup. And in particular, what should be very interesting for people who study usual subgroups of SU3, the usual SU3 is that the same condition holds. If you have these conditions satisfied, so if you find numbers in triangles with the, the properties described here, uh, and if you have a graph of norm equal to three, then it is a graph of a subgroup of SU3. So we can characterize this way things without looking at group elements. Now, uh, on the constructive side, there's a method starting from that modular invariant uh, um, uh, matrix, which builds uh, these graphs. So if you know the modular invariants, uh, you can build them. And there's a strange inequality, which has as a result that uh, there's an upper bound for the uh, for each uh, for uh, for SU3 for SU4 and in general for any Lie group. There's an upper bound for the levels of exceptional graphs. So there are only finitely many exceptional graphs possible. The bounds given this way are are, are very big, but the actual bounds, 
which arise are, are surprisingly small. SU4, the exceptionals have, uh, have a level at most uh, eight. These are, and there are also only three exceptionals for SU4. So again, you see that there's, it's a huge difference compared to the, the usual subgroups. So this is the biggest, uh, this one has been done with a lot of computation. I had to, uh, the SU3 characterization can be, uh, um, can be done by hand. You, you don't need a computer there. But SU4 is, uh, is a bit harder. And these encode all kinds of things. In particular, what's interesting probably for this conference is that they encode boundary conditions. So if you put a topological quantum field theory in this room, then the boundary condition the, uh, 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 for it uh, is uh, given by objects of type AB. So if the objects of type A describe the inside, objects of type AB describe all the possible boundaries. And uh, we have also all kinds of explanations of, uh, of um, the uh, um, of the modular matrix entries. Now, let me describe very uh, briefly uh, how one gets a simple Lie group from quantum subgroups of SU2. So, first of all, if you have such a quantum subgroup, so this is actually the the uh, the correspondence. You have a um, you want to, uh, uh, I mean, the usual method is to work separately with the upper triangular and lower triangular parts. But actually, it's much more natural to, uh, to handle them both at the same time. So for SU, uh, for SU uh, uh, n, uh, n by n matrices, you can take the off-diagonal part and reassemble it into a ribbon like this. Uh, let me... Uh, Yes, so uh, let me uh, uh, try here to uh, to show uh, this ribbon in movement. So these are the, the n by n matrices. You separate the diagonal part as in Carton, and you move uh, the off diagonal part like this, and then you close it in a circle. And now you have the, the natural ribbon structure on it. And uh, you, can, you can build the, uh, the, the same way uh, the roots of any other, for any other uh, graph. You just take the Cartesian product of the graph with the integers modulo 2 coxet a number. And the product should be over Z mod 2. So that's the most natural. You get this way all the roots at the same time. Now, you have uh, for these graphs a graph Laplacian, the adjacency matrix, and you have one for the horizontal graph, like E6, and you have another, another graph of the, of, uh, for the vertical graph. And you call the harmonic uh, functions the functions for which the horizontal Laplacian is equal to the vertical Laplacian. So the sum of neighbors vertically is the sum of neighbors uh, horizontally on the ribbon. And then what happens is that if you project onto this subspace the Dirac function at a point, you get exactly the inner product of that root with all the others. So the metric is obtained, uh, I mean, the inner products are obtained in a very, very simple way this way. The weights are integer valued harmonic functions. So the weights appear very naturally as well. And now you have the roots on a root shell, on a ribbon. And you can see actually this ribbon, you see and the vertical on the ribbon is a, the uh, coxet uh, element. You can see it on the sculpture itself. So this is uh, the D4, I'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, in fact, uh, something that I will uh, only briefly discuss is that if you have a basis with integer coefficients, uh, uh, of the universal enveloping algebra, then it chooses for you precisely this ribbon. 
this is shown in the following way. In the basis, uh, suppose that you look at E1, 2, E2, 3. Uh, E1, 2, E2, 3 minus E2, 3, E1, 2 contains E1, 3, is equal to E1, 3, right? So if you have integer coefficients and you look at it modulo 2, then the result is either in the first, in E1, 2 times E2, 3, or in E2, 3 times E1, 2. So it breaks the symmetry, the place where the, uh, where the result is. And if you put all this uh, breaking of symmetry together, then you'll find exactly the order structure on the ribbon. Now, the, uh, the, uh, the thing that one, one should use, uh, so there's a way to use uh, the uh, essential paths, or paths uh, which have no repetitions essentially, put them one after the other and project onto the same uh, essential path. Uh, so a very combinatorial way to describe a product of paths on, these, on this ribbon. And with this product, if you use uh, this product, you can, um, you can define some homes. Using these homes between points on the, on the ribbon, the composition of the homes, so once again, the composition of the homes is you put two, two uh, paths head to tail, and you project, you take out the repetitions by projecting onto a subspace. So for these homes, the exact sequences have exactly six terms. And using exact sequences and extensions, counting extensions, you get precisely the universal enveloping algebra. So let me uh, skip. As I, would like to, uh, I would like to go to the, uh, in the last few minutes, to some, um, uh, some consequences of this. Uh, there's also, um, so what one uses here are paths on the graph. And with these paths, one can um, uh, find natural basis for irreducible representations of the Lie groups as well. So if you want, for instance, uh, an irreducible representation corresponding to this point of the Coxeter, of the AD graph, you take all the points which are related by, pa by this essential path, by path to the base point, and which are not in the wake of each other. So there should be no path from one to the other. And if you take these combinations, then you get, uh, you get a basis. Uh, let me show here the case of, uh, of the graph AN. You see that in this case, uh, the, if you take two points, which are not in the wake of each other, endpoints which are not in the wake of each other, you can translate them using a combinatorial mechanism into precisely the usual description of, uh, of um, exterior products. Again, the irreducible representations for E6 obtained this way, the canonical basis, a canonical basis for it. So the, the interesting thing is that these bases seem to be uh, different from the, the usual basis for uh, uh, representations, the Lustig and Kashiwara and so on. Uh, also, if you count these essential paths up to the points uh, on the graph, if you count the total number of paths, then the product of these numbers is exactly the Weyl denominator in the Weyl formula. And if you add to it what uh, the points that you, uh, uh, I mean, if you add some extra numbers, some extra starting points, you get the Weyl uh, numerator as well. So uh, the Weyl formula appears in a very natural way. And finally, in the, in the last three minutes or so, I'd like to talk about the high analogs of these simple Lie groups. So what happens if you start not from uh, subgroups of SU2, but from subgroups of uh, SUK, like the ones that you saw before? You'll get the same way as before some lattices. And uh, 
uh, namely, you have again a, uh, a bi -har a harmonic, the harmonic functions. You, have a, you do a Cartesian product between the graph and the root lattice, modulo period, and you take functions which, uh, which have the sum on one direction should be the same with the sum in the other direction. And uh, you obtain some uh, new roots. Now, the only known case for these roots was uh, the case of SU3 at the first level. So the simplest case possible, a simple triangle. And uh, I have uh, found the function for these in the database of uh, root lattices. It was, the, uh, it was a known graph, but other than that, all of them are new. So here's how you do the product. This is a, an exceptional of SU3. You take the product between this and the period of the lattice SU3. And now you take, uh, on this Cartesian product, you take the functions which have the same sum of neighbors on the left as with respect to the right group. And you project the Dirac function, for instance, at this point, onto uh, this subspace. And what you get is exactly the inner product of this root with all the other roots. So, uh, and this is a case which I discussed before, the simplest case, SU3, the triangle. And the lattice that one obtains this way is uh, D6 plus, which had never been used in representation theory before. What's interesting here is that instead of the usual, the usual uh, angular structure for uh, lattices, which is uh, things at 60 degrees, the shape of the letter Y, what you have here, these vectors, these new roots for SU3, point from the middle of a tetrahedron into the vertices. So you need to add four of them to get zero, which points out that these should be structures which are, uh, which are no longer binary, but they are ternary for SU3, quaternary for SU4, and so on. So exactly the kind of structures that you need to build uh, higher dimensional quantum field theory. And uh, the case AN uh, came out, uh, in the case AN, remember that the usual lattices are very concrete. You have elements of type HIJ with a plus one on the position I and the negative one on the position J. In the case uh, of SU3, you have six non-zero elements which are obtained in a kind of kaleidoscope. You put the plus one and you reflect it all around and you get plus one, minus one, like here, the rest zero. And this has a property that the sum in any of the vial directions is zero. So this is the, uh, these are the roots of the higher SUN analog. And uh, uh, the equality uh, similar to HIJ plus HJK is HIK, uh, the Jacobi identity, has now four terms for SU3. And uh, it, uh, appear, they appear to correspond precisely to the four faces of a tetrahedron rather than for a triangle. The same one dimension higher for SU4, it, you have five terms. So uh, finally, uh, let me show here how the A and type lattices work. For SU2, the lattice is Z. Now, if you want to go for the graph AN in general, the usual AN, you put each point, you replace each point of the lattice by a copy of Z, and you take a period. So the usual, uh, the lattice for SU3 is Z plus Z plus Z, in which the sum of a period is zero, yes? Now, if you want to go from there further, you take uh, the lattice of this kind, and you take a period. The period is not quite visible with this projector. It's a period about... Uh, uh, this uh, big, and what you have is a sum on each vial direction should be zero. So you take a, a, a copies of Z at every point of a lattice, and you ask for the condition that the sum in all directions, vial directions, is zero. These are the higher lattices of type AN. But of course, what keeps this from being trivial is the fact that each of the orbifolds, each of the exceptional subgroups, also give lattices of the same kind. So um, what keeps, so, so those exceptionals are for me a guard against triviality because uh, 
Uh, there's no known mechanism among the usual ADEs which, ex which explains those exceptionals. And each of those exceptionals give rate to the same uh, structure. Now, if you, uh, with data from the usual SU2, what you get, remember things don't depend on triangulations because of associativity, what you get are Hilbert spaces for surfaces with points. So that's why you have points, particles as points, on a surface. And that's the structure in all the usual uh, things. Now, if you, if you would use, instead of that SU4, it turns out that instead of points, you would have one skeleton, exactly Feynman diagrams. So the data from the subgroups of SU4, if, you, if one completes this project, should fill exactly the space between Feynman diagrams. So the particles would be simply edges of the thing, and they would dictate what kind of homes are surrounding them. So there's a chance to start uh, to do quantum field theory from a completely new point of view. If you had these vector spaces around Feynman diagrams, you could compute with them relative probabilities and, and uh, all the things that you need in, in physics. So, uh, and moreover, these would be pure, really four-dimensional, so you wouldn't have the problem that you have in string theory that uh, because you work on a two-dimensional string, you, you have a very hard time finding the actual particles which depend on the interaction with space. So if you want particles, you need to be in the correct number of dimensions, physical number of dimensions, four. So you need to do exactly what you do in conformal field theory, but in four dimensions directly. So I'd like to stop here. <laughs>